Today's scripture is taken from Matthew chapter 12, verses 11 through 30. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The word of the Amen. Thank you. Children are dismissed if they'd like to head out to Children's Church. Two weeks from now, September 10th, we're going to start a new series. Um, at that, that point, the series we will start is in the book of Job. And I personally am chomping at the bit. Now, I don't know that everyone here is necessarily. <laughs> I've already had a couple people read it in the newsletter and came up and said, we're doing Job. Just, yes. Uh, and we are uh, in two weeks because I think personally the book of Job is one of the most practical, um, most personal, and most powerful books uh, in all of Scripture simply because the book of Job is unbelievably relatable. I mean, it's the story of a, a man who thought he knew who he was and thought he knew who the Lord was, and then everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong. Like, everything. And all that the book of Job is is this 40-some chapters of Job and his wife and his friends all asking questions. And the questions, they bombard us, and they come fast, and they are sort of true but not, and they are the questions that every person asks when life hurts. And they really all just boil down to, so who is God? Is he still who I thought he was? And who am I? And maybe even more importantly, who am I in his eyes that he would let this happen to me? And I'm excited. And I thought about just jumping in. Like, we're just going to dive in and we're going to get started because I'm off from, just got back from vacation and I'm real ready to go. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, Job is incredibly beautiful, powerful book where we get to ask the questions, you know, the ones that you won't ask out loud in church, the ones that you will not say in Sunday school. Some of us, they're the questions we won't even say to ourselves ever. But maybe before we get to Job with the really hard-hitting questions, maybe it's worthwhile to just camp here. It's been just two weeks, we're going to spend this week and next week in these verses. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Because this is this unique, beautiful invitation that Jesus issues. And it's one of these things that is so beautiful. Like, the, the decor designers at Hobby Lobby like to take this and put it on tchotchkes and sell it to us, right? <laughs> they don't do that with Job, okay? <laughs> but, in this invitation that only shows up in the Gospel of Matthew, it's the only time that Jesus just says, here, I, I want you to come to me, what we see is the answer to some pretty amazing questions, like, who is he? And who is it that he most wants? We're going to see what is the only thing he asks of us, uh, no matter whether you're in the mountain or in the valley. Um, we will see things like, when you come, what is it that he promises? And how is it that you actually get it? We're going to walk through this for the next two weeks. Today we're just going to look at who is the Lord, who is it that he most wants, and what's the one thing he asks of us. Because it occurred to me that maybe if we look at um, the passage that seems a little easier, and we answer these questions, we will discover something remarkable, which is that the answer is the same. Whether you're looking at it in, in Matthew's gospel in this beautiful invitation, or you are where Job is, and you can't hear the voice of the Lord, but you have some serious questions for him, the answer is the same. So we're going to walk through this one together for the next couple of weeks. And to, to start, we, we probably need to actually just start with this phrase. In heart. You're going to see what Jesus is talking to us about and why it is that he describes who he is in heart. Now, in English, when we talk about our heart, we mean a piece of ourselves, right? If we're not talking literally, we're not at the cardiologist, okay? Metaphorically, when we talk about a heart, we just mean a piece of who we are. And generally speaking, our heart is the piece of our personality that is illogical and emotive, right? Because we'll say things like, okay, with my mind, I know the best thing to do is, mm -hmm, but my heart, right? 
And it's almost like we think we're two different people and one of us is logical and one of us is not. <laughs> Jesus, on the other hand, was not a contemporary American who spoke English, okay? So when he uses the word heart, he comes as a Jewish man steeped in Hebraic idiom. And for him, heart isn't a piece of who he is. To talk about his heart is to say who he is. It means he's about to tell you who he is at his core, like in the very center of his being. The idea of talking about what you are at heart in a Jewish culture means that he is describing what, what defines him. He says, this at my core, these are the two words that if you want to describe me, this is it. It sums up all of who I am, my whole personality. You can parse it out a million different ways, but all of who I am is these two words. And if you know what defines him, then you also know what drives him. And what drives every single interaction that he ever has. This is part of why Matthew 11, 28 through 30 is so beautiful. There's literally nowhere else in the four Gospels where Jesus says, let me just tell you who I am. Let me tell you what defines me and drives me. This is, this is the center of my being. Everything emanates from these two words. Now, some of you have been to Hobby Lobby and they are printed on your wall. Uh, Tom just read them for us. Uh, I just had them on the screen. If your Bible is open, you can cheat and look at the two words. We all know what they are. But I want you to pretend you don't for a hot second. And I want you to just try and exercise with me. Right? And if you are like me, then this is an exercise you should scribble on your bulletin or in your journal to actually do this later because I personally can't do an exercise while <clears throat> someone drones on. <laughs> but mute sermons are not entertaining, so we'll keep moving. I want you to just think for a minute, if we actually evaluated your life, right, like how you interact with Jesus, right? if I looked at myself and I said, okay, Kelly, I, I know what the two words are, but how do I live in relation to Jesus? Like, the way I, I interact with him or don't the way I think about him, or don't? What do I actually, at the core of my being, believe is Jesus' heart? Does that make sense? Because maybe you would find words like, if you filled it out, maybe you would say, okay, if I'm really honest, I genuinely believe that Jesus should answer this, that he is holy and untouchable in heart. And that's who he is. His very essence is that he is holy and completely unlike me, and for that reason, I can't get anywhere near him, and he doesn't want me anywhere near him. Would you answer it things like, Jesus is gracious and grudging in heart, or, or that he is powerful and intimidating? Dude scares you. It, maybe Jesus is brash and impulsive, so when he says to follow, you need to really count the cost and probably tell him no. Is Jesus unapproachable and mysterious? Is he harsh and critical? Would you say things like Jesus is distant and he is uncaring? Or how about that he's kind, but he's impotent in heart? How would you fill it out? What would be the two words that if you base not on what you want to think or what you would like to be true, but the way you actually treat him? What do you think Jesus is at his core. See, because that's a question that matters. In some ways, honestly, it matters at least as much as how he actually answers the question. Think about it this way. If I had a cup up here and it was filled to the brim with coffee, I'd been over to Coffee Cafe, I'd hit the little button on the Keurig, and ta-da, the elixir of life was in my cup. If you bumped into me, what's going to come out of the cup? Coffee, right? If it's filled with water, what comes out of the cup? Good job. If it's filled with acid, you're catching on. Okay. If you look at Jesus and you think in his heart of hearts that who he genuinely is, what defines him and what drives him is that he is harsh and critical, then it's almost like he's filled with acid. And you're never going to try to bump into him. Right? If in your heart of hearts you think Jesus is harsh and critical, then you cannot come to him and say, you need help. Because what's going to happen is that acid spills out. And in your mind, Jesus' response to you is to treat you like you're about this big. 
and just tell you why you messed up and why he shouldn't have to fix your problems again. If in your mind what Jesus is filled with is that he, uh, you know, his cup is he's, he's gracious but grudging, well, then you're going to bump against him every time you turn around because in your head you got to bump. you got to ask and ask and ask and beg and plead and do it again and again and again and again because he'll finally give in, but he's begrudging about it. What you see as being the core of what drives Jesus in his every interaction with you determines how you do or don't approach him. If he's just a mystery, what's the point of bumping? (laughs) You'll never get to know him. If he's the kindest man in the world who has zippo power, then you come when you want to be told you're loved, but you don't go near him when you actually need help. If he's very powerful and incredibly terrifying, then you keep him at a distance. This is maybe an exercise worth trying because I think it matters. But it doesn't matter as much as how Jesus answers the question. You see, the truth is, we talk around here about being disciples who believe our God at his word. And I am 30 plus years into this whole follow Jesus thing, and I'm still trying to believe him at his word. Because to believe him at his word means that however I fill it in, has to surrender to what he actually says. And Jesus filled it in for us. The first thing he said was that he is gentle in heart. That's the core of my Savior. The core of the one who holds all power of infinite ability, the one who spoke and the world came into creation, he is gentle. To be gentle means that he's kind, right? It means that he is not harsh, isn't antagonistic. He's not easily exasperated. But his, uh, the posture most comfortable to him is not a pointed finger, or for that matter, crossed arms. If Jesus is gentle, then the way he interacts with you now, you bump into him, what po- pours out is kindness. Now, sometimes we get a little confused about what gentleness means. Right? For Jesus to be gentle does not mean, for instance, that if you come before Jesus as the sinner that all of us are, for Jesus to be gentle does not mean that he then says, you know what, everybody sins, you're human, it's okay. That's actually not kind. I mean, that would be the equivalent of if you went to the doctor this week and your arm is just dangling over here, kind of all over the place, there's, there's a bone sticking out, and you just tried to hide it. And the doctor goes, oh, I can see what we have, but it's human to break your arm. So let's just not talk. If you have a doctor that does that, what do you do? You sue for malpractice, right? You say, get a new doctor. That's not gentle. In that case, the doctor needs to look at you and say, I can see there's something wrong that you're trying to hide. The doctor needs to look and say, how did it happen? And what can we do to prevent it from ever happening again? And with great gentleness, do something that's really going to hurt. Put everything back the way it's supposed to be. And with incredible gentleness, the doctor might even need to immobilize that arm and restrict the things that you are permitted to do for the next chunk of your life because the doctor looks at you and says, the only way to restore this limb for its full functionality and purpose is if you let me gently deal with what's broken. You have a savior who's incredibly gentle. And he does not mean, he says, let's not talk about your sin. It means he says, I love you so much that when you finally come and confess it, we can actually deal with it. But you can apply that, my friend, to every interaction you have with him. If your first thought when you approach Jesus is he's going to be ticked, then you need to surrender it to this. He's gentle in heart. He's not just gentle, though. He says, I'm gentle, and probably the better translation than humble is I'm lowly. Gentle and lowly in heart. Now, this one boggles my brain. Because the truth of the matter is that of uh, anyone who has ever walked the face of the planet, Jesus should not be lowly. I mean, he is the most highest exalted one there ever has been, guys. We are talking about the Son of God, 
who's seated right now at the right hand of his Father, who continues to hold everything in his hand. And if, if Jesus was just a human being, he would be the human being who had the, the penthouse apartment and the office that was way up yonder behind a bunch of bodyguards and the likes of none of us are getting near him. But Jesus says, even though that's what I deserve, who I am at my core, the what drives me, what defines me is that I'm lowly. And lowly means approachable. It means accessible. It means the King of Kings is available to all. That's who your Savior is. Truth is, there are some of us here who refuse to bump into Jesus. You can go out of your way to avoid ever actually getting near him because you're terrified that he doesn't want the likes of you to approach him. For some of us treat Jesus like, like every time he looks at us, I mean, you know, okay, he loves us because we sang about that when we were five and we know the Bible says so. But we still act like when Jesus looks at us, he does it down his nose like, well, like you're a slimy slug or a sweaty sock. You know that kind of look? <laughs> but Jesus says, that's not who I am. I'm lowly. I, lowly in that I am available and accessible to every single human being, always, at all times. You know, part of Jesus being lowly means that he actually desires to have a relationship. Um, maybe there's people in your world, like I can think of like, some of my professors when I was in seminary, the first time I met them, there was like you, oh, high exalted one who control my grade, right? <laughs> Your doctor so-and-so who I could only approach if I signed up for office hours and only could call Dr. So-and-so, and you sort of felt like you were there bothering them. A couple of them became friends. And I know them by their first name. And that meant I had access not just to their office, but I could go to their homes. We could meet for coffee. Because they went from this, you're terrifyingly high and exalted, to no, they're just lowly. There are people who are open and accessible and desire a relationship with me. You know, I'm pretty sure that part of what Jesus is trying to say is that at his heart of hearts, he wants an inside joke with you. His heart of hearts, he wants to have an intimate relationship with every single one of us. If your uh, thought, like when you picture that, that cup, if you think that when you approach Jesus, what happens is he recoils, then you need to surrender that because his heart is gentle and lowly. This is who he is. And this gentle and lowly person, do you know who he most wants? So Jesus says, all who are just slaving to try to make yourselves good enough for fill in the blank, for him, for you, for your deceased parent, for your spouse, for your boss, everybody who's trying so, so hard to be good, and you know, you know at your core, you can't do it, and it's wearing you out. He says, that's who I want. All who are tired of trying to hold the world together, and you get everything fine here, and then ugh, something happens over here, because as it turns out, you're actually not in control. All of you who are tired. All who are worn thin at trying to be God for your family member. Or you're trying to be what somebody else needs and only he's the one who can actually do it. He says, all who are weary, that's who he wants. Not all who have it together, not all who've got it figured out, not all who don't need him. Because you do understand that's the alternative, right? All who are weary and who are burdened. Or if I were going to write it, because I like alliteration, weighed down. Now, burdened, he has no qualifier. Do you notice that? Because if I were writing the guest list, I would, I would put some qualifiers. I would say all who are burdened by grief, you know, by, the, by the pain of this life that you didn't cause and you cannot avoid, but it is just weighing you down. You are welcome. But all who are burdened by problems you caused? Eh, eh. No, not happening. But there's no asterisk. He just says all who are burdened. Whether it is grief or it is the suffering that, frankly, I am mostly responsible for, whether you're burdened by worry, whether you are burdened by uh, guilt and shame that you just can't seem to release, it, or you're burdened by the weight of the sin, you actually aren't sure you want to give up. 
Jesus says, all who are weary and burdened, that's who he wants. Now that word is a challenge and a comfort. It's a challenge because I just don't think there's very many of us who, when we describe ourselves, if we gave the two words about who we are, would choose, I am weary and burdened. And so when Jesus says, that's who I want, sometimes, all of us at some point, our pride rears up and we say, I'm not weary, Jesus, I got it. I got my life, I can hold it together, I can do whatever I want, which is to look at the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and say, I don't need you. Sometimes we're so prideful that when he says, I'll take every person who is burdened, we say, I don't want to go because that would lump me in with that person. Well, that person's going to experience his rest and you're not. It's a challenge because to be the person who he most desires means I have to agree with his assessment of where I really am. And there isn't a moment in my life where there isn't something that doesn't, where I'm not wearied and burdened. And that's where there's comfort. Because Jesus says all. Genuinely all. Whatever is wearing you out in this moment, in this season, on this day, whatever is the burden that is weighing on you, he says you come to me. And he doesn't say you get to do it once. He says do it for a lifetime. He is gentle and lowly. Who he most wants is those who are weary and burdened. And he only asks us to do one thing. Come to him. And we're going to talk next week about how it is when the weary and the burdened come to the gentle and lowly Savior that we actually find rest. All right? Not like go on a vacation, rest. Like biblical rest. We're going to talk next week, but what does that actually mean? What does it look like? Why is rest for my souls the thing I most need today? And we will see that you only get that by taking on his yoke and learning from this gentle, lowly Savior. But before we can go there, probably just need to deal with the actual command. Come to him. And I want us to look at this two ways. Because some of us in the room, the thing that you most need to hear from your gentle and lowly Savior who wants you, who are weary and burdened, is that he wants you, mm, he commands you to come. See, here's the thing about the word come. It implies movement. Like, I got to do something. I cannot actually go to Jesus and stay where I am. I can't follow him and be unchanged. It's not possible. And, and I mean this from the depths of my being with as much love and compassion as I know how to convey while I stand here today. There are some of us who have no problem saying you believe that Jesus is gentle and lowly, uh, that you know he wants the weary and burdened, and you haven't moved an inch closer to him in a week or a month or a decade. You don't get rest unless you come. And so that's going to mean really concrete things for some of us. It, things like, for instance, it is impossible to stop being weary of trying and trying and trying and trying to make yourself good enough or fix everything or be in charge or whatever it is that's wearing you out if you won't go to him. Because Jesus will not let you keep doing that. So sometimes coming to Jesus means having to say my identity isn't tied up in trying to be perfect. And I lay it down and I come to the one who is. And that's a pride moment. You know, you, you cannot expect to find that there is relief from the burdens that you're experiencing if you will never drop them and come to Jesus. So things like, if you say to the Lord, I can't come because the shame and guilt that I'm carrying that is weighing me down is what would make you look at me like I'm a sweaty sock. Jesus stands there and says, come to me but I will not let you keep holding on to that burden. you got to give it to me. Or if the thing that you won't come is the burden of sin that, quite frankly, you love more than Jesus. You won't find rest until the day comes when you look at Jesus and say, I'll come. He'll deal with the burden when you get there. My guess is that if you're in this camp, like moving towards Jesus, it's just not something that's happening right now, you know what he's been asking. You're not dumb, and he ain't mute. 
And if you haven't been able to do it up until this point, may I be so bold as to say you probably won't do it today on your own. So probably what you need to do is come up here to the prayer ministers and confess. I know that the Lord is asking me to come. I even know what it is he wants me to do. I know what it looks like to move closer to Jesus. Let them pray with you. But then find a brother or sister in Christ and say to them, I know what he's asked me to do. Here's why I'm struggling. And let your mentor help you. Some of us, we need to move. Some of us, though, need to come to the one who's gentle and lowly. If you go back to that exercise we did a little bit ago, if as we're talking this morning, you realize you have a caricature of Jesus, like in your heart of hearts, you do not think he is gentle and lowly in heart. Like you don't live that way. You, you do not think that when you bump into him, he is gentle. You don't think that he is approachable and accessible and available to you at all times. If your picture of Jesus is not what he says his heart is, then I think his invitation today is that you would surrender the caricature and come to the one who is gentle and lowly. Now, that's not easy, right? Uh, here, think about this in, in, in less terms, but if there's probably been someone in your world who you got a picture of, of how they were, and everyone else around you said, they're not that way. <laughs> But it doesn't matter, because in your brain, that's who they are. So you approach them like they are the caricature that you have. To start approaching that person differently will be hard work. You gotta actually give them the benefit of the doubt. Let them show they're not who you thought they were. And that's gonna be the same thing with Jesus. So let me be so bold as to say to those of us who our issue is less of, of coming and more of that we need to know who we're going to. If you haven't done that on your own, I'm probably not going to change in about 15 minutes. So maybe you should find a prayer minister and say, I need to confess that my picture of Jesus is not who he is. Looks more like my dad. Looks more like my first pastor. Looks more like me. And then probably should find a brother or sister in Christ and start meeting with them on a regular basis and say, okay, I want to come to the one who is gentle and lowly. I want that to change how I pray or don't pray, uh, how I read the Bible or don't read the Bible, how, how I respond when he speaks. And that might mean grabbing coffee with a brother or sister for a while and saying, help me see how my picture of Jesus has influenced so much of how I do or don't come to him. There is rest for our souls when we come. There is this beautiful Savior that we're invited to learn from, but that starts with coming, moving towards Jesus, and being willing to know that the one we come to is our gentle and lowly Savior. This is the invitation he has, whether you're in the mountain or the valley, but it is the invitation, right? He's not going to force you and I to accept it. He will simply issue it again and again and again as we keep saying yes. We're going to invite the band to come forward and as they do, we're going to go before our king in prayer. And I'm going to invite you to pray. If you need to talk to him about how you need to move towards your Savior, you who are weary and burdened, then do. And if you need to come and just talk to him about who he is, then invite him to show you. Because together, we come to him in prayer. Jesus, thanks for this invitation. I thank you that you're a, thank you that you're a God who's willing to invite us, the weary and the burdened. You invite us to come near. You invite us to bring 
what is weighing us down, to bring what has us so tired. You, you don't ask us to figure it out and change it. You just say, come to you so that you can show us more and more of who you are. Set us free in a way that brings rest, Lord, and not just to our bodies, but to our souls. And so I, I pray for myself and I pray for my brothers and sisters here, Lord, that for each one of us who need to move, Lord, we need to say yes, we need to, to leave where we are in order to go and to follow you. Whatever that looks like, I pray that today your spirit would speak in such a way that, Lord, you wouldn't let us forget the invitation. But even if today we say, I'm not letting anybody see me need to be prayed for, that, Lord, you would, you would just pester us in the most beautifully gentle way until we say yes to your invitation. Lord, for, for those of us who our struggle is that we don't actually believe that you're gentle and lowly, we have another picture of you, and it's wrong. Lord, may we be willing uh, today to confess that picture. And again, Lord, if, if we say no, I, I pray that your spirit would, would pursue, that you would come after us, because it is your greatest desire, the people you most want are us. Thanks for loving us, Jesus. We pray these things in your name and all of God's people said, amen.